Aren't you glad this morning that Jesus is the King? He is a King worthy of our worship. He's a King worthy of our service. He's a King who calls us to mission. The King has a purpose for each and every one of us. And uh, that's what we're talking about this morning is focusing on our mission. And uh, we've been focusing on focus uh, for this, the first part of the year. The first sermon a few weeks ago, we talked about focusing on your spiritual life and how important it is for every Christian to quit looking behind and to start looking ahead and to keep looking up and press on to the, uh, to the upper call of Christ in, uh, in Christ, God in Christ Jesus, striving for that prize in our spiritual life. Last week, we talked about uh, focusing on spiritual awakening and our need for revival. And uh, we kicked off a 21 days of fasting and prayer, and that's what we're doing as a church. We're in the middle of it. We're, we're in, on day 7, and if you're fasting along with us, you know uh, at this point that those first three days were pretty tough, weren't they? Whatever it, you decided to fast from, uh, your body was telling you it, it, that was not a good idea by about day 2 or 3. I just want you to know that, that warm lemon water is warm, but it is not coffee. Amen? It is not coffee. And uh, but you know after about day three or four headaches recede and and uh, and the Lord blesses I I don't know about you but uh, had really good times in prayer and and read my Bible this week and and it's a good thing it's a, you know I want to encourage you if you're fasting and you fail in it now listen to me that's part of what fasting does you know what it teaches you it teaches you that you're not strong enough to do what you say you're going to do how many of you know that our relationship to God is based on His grace not our not our ability to do things and so listen to me. If you mess up in, fa- in your fast, don't give up. You turn to the Lord. You, you know, confess and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm weak. And, uh, and God, I just pray that you'd help me. And you keep on going, all right? You keep seeking the Lord and uh, trust Him to bless you. So I want to encourage you to stay in the game. Keep, keep on, on reading your Bible. Keep on seeking the Lord during this time of 21 days. But today we're focusing on our mission. And, uh, and I want us to talk this morning. Now, listen, not about missions. You know, that's when I say focus on mission, I don't mean missions with an S. Now, missions is awesome, and uh, we're all about missions here at Enon. As a matter of fact, uh, we, we, we talk about serving in, and we talk about serving out, and how every believer needs to serve in, but every need, believer needs to serve out. If it was my, if, I, if Christianity was a dictatorship, and I could be the dictator, and I can make y'all do everything I think y'all to do. One of the things I would make everybody do uh, when they get saved is go on at least one mission trip. Everybody needs to go on a mission trip and and experience another culture and and the faith walk that that takes you to do. And it's a great thing; helps you grow. And uh, we're in, in, de- dedicated to missions here at Ena. As a matter of fact, uh, tonight uh, we're going to talk about uh, missions in our in our in our Sunday night service. We're uh, launching two new things. Uh, for our church. One is we've got a new relationship with a church planner in Las Vegas. We're going to work with the North American Mission Board. Uh, NAM, the North American Mission Board, has a program they call, uh, they want churches to partner with what they call SEND cities, S-E-N-D cities. And these are some of the, the cities in North America that are growing the fastest, that are the lostest, and that have the greatest need. And so we've decided uh, that we're going to partner as a church with Sin City, Las Vegas. Our Sin City is Sin City, all right? And uh, there's a church planner out there uh, named Michael Horner, and he's planning a new church. And, and I don't know if you know, we'll talk a little bit about Las Vegas tonight, uh, but it's one of the fastest growing areas in America and, uh, and extremely lost. And uh, Michael Horner is a, a boy from Memphis, got a sweet family, growing family, and uh, they're just getting started on their church plant. And we're going to send our student ministry, our student team out there this, this summer in June. And so our, our, our high school students, college students, and if you're a parent and you've got a, uh, got a middle school student, we encourage you, this is a great opportunity to even have a family trip. This would be a great father-son trip, you know, uh, whatever. And, and so just want to encourage you uh, to, to look. Now, there's an interest meeting tonight, uh, this afternoon at 5 o'clock in YB109. That's the room number, YB109. That's in the youth building. Uh, if you've been around here very long, that's, that's Brother Ron Allen's class, all right? And so if you're interested at all in your child going to Las Vegas or you going to Las Vegas, your family going to Las Vegas, uh, Brother Dominic's going to be leading that interest meeting at 5. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight in our, in our Sunday night worship service. But I'm also excited because we've uh, got a new opportunity for our church to connect with, uh, with China, too. We're sending a team to China in a few weeks or in a month or so. 
And uh, you're going to hear all about that tonight. We're going to pray for the team, and we're going to uh, you're going to have opportunity. There's still opportunity to sign up. So if you think if you think if there's anywhere in your heart where the Lord might want you to go to China, we're going to give you an opportunity. You come tonight and learn about it. We've actually got the missionary uh, that we are going to partner with is a, a missionary named Leroy Brewer, Leroy and Sharon. They're actually here today, and uh, they're going to be tonight, and Leroy's going to share a little bit of his story about how God called him into missions and, uh, and what God's doing in China and what that trip's going to look like. Uh, Bruce Bailey's going to share a little bit. He's been partnering with Leroy for quite some time, and they're going to tell you all about what that trip is going to look like tonight, and we're going to pray about that during our Sunday night service. So we're all about missions at Enon Baptist Church. Missions is good. All right? That's not right grammar, but missions is good. And, uh, and we love missions. But now listen. Here's the thing, for many Christians, here's, here's why missions is part of what your mission ought to be about, but missions is not all about your mission. For many Christians, missions is about what other people do in other places, right? It's what other people are doing out there, over there, way off yonder somewhere. And for some Christians, they like it that way. They, want, they would love to, to think that, that, that their life is just fine and, and, you know, missions is about what you do in other places. But now listen... Missions is a part of your mission, but this morning I'm talking more about something more than just supporting missions, all right? I'm talking about are you on mission in your life where you live, where you work, where you play? Are you on mission? Now here's the best way I can uh, encourage you to ask a question to ask to determine are you on mission? And this is just simply this question. Are you surviving or are you thriving? Are you surviving or are you thriving? Now, if you're surviving, and too many people, I believe, today are just surviving. If you're surviving, that means you're spending your life working to make a living. You're spending your life working to make a living. Here's what I want you to understand this morning. God wants more for you than you just to survive. God wants you to thrive. And when you're thriving, you're not just spending your life. Listen, you're investing your life. When you're surviving, you're spending your life. But when you're thriving, you're investing your life. When you're thriving, you're not just working, you're serving. When you're thriving, you're not just making a living. Listen, you're making a difference. You are created not just to survive. God has created you to thrive. He wants you on mission. If you're on mission, you will thrive. But if you're not on mission, listen, you're just surviving. And here's another thing I want to encourage you about. Your mission, what I'm talking about this morning, is not your job. Now, you can be called to a lot of different jobs. I believe God calls, uh, calls people to a lot of different things. He doesn't just call preachers. I, how many of you know that one of the highest callings you can have in life is to be a teacher? My, both my parents were public school teachers. I was talking to somebody a while ago about how my daddy was a, a principal. I had my daddy for sixth grade math. I was so deceptively good in his class it wasn't even right. Uh, you know, but I didn't get away with nothing in school because my mom and dad were public school teachers, and uh, I ate, I ate the I ate public school breakfast, public school. If they'd had public school supper, I'd been there for that too, right? But I actually liked the pizza. Now I miss public school pizza. But you know, we uh, I grew up in in public school, and I know teachers are called. You know, firefighters I believe are called. Law law enforcement officers are called. Doctors are called. Lawyers are called. Truck drivers are called. You know, God calls you to a job, but your job, listen is not your mission. You can have two people doing the same job. You can have two teachers. You can have two business owners. You can have two law enforcement officials. You can have two firefighters, two two pastors. (laughs) You can have two pastors. And one can be on mission, but the other one may not be on mission. Your mission is not your job. Your job is a tool. Your job is a means of accomplishing a mission But it's not your mission. Now, here's what I want to tell you about what mission really is. Mission is what you're created for. You are created for mission. God designed you to make a difference. God designed you to have an impact. God designed you to live a life that is significant, that makes a difference. And here's the thing. God not only created you for mission. Listen, He calls you to mission. And when you understand that God created you for mission, then you understand that when God calls you to mission and you obey Him, you know what God's doing? He's meeting your deepest needs as a person. When God calls you to mission 
and you obey Him, you are doing that not just for God, not for other people. Listen, you're doing that for you. It's one of the best things you can do to be all God wants you to be. There's a famous missionary who went down to uh, South America, and he was a, a missionary down there amongst some, uh, 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 some unreached Indian groups down there. And uh, he and his group got killed almost just at the beginning of the mission. They went in and flew in on a plane, and, and this group killed him. His name was Jim Elliott. And he lost his life on the mission field. Now, uh, just a little bit later, his wife, Elizabeth Elliott, and some of the wives of those missionaries got, got killed, went back down there and won that tribe to Jesus. It's an amazing story if you've ever heard it. It's called Gates of Splendor is the story of Jim Elliott. But Jim Elliott wrote his journals, and one of the things Jim Elliott's famous for saying is a man is no fool who will give away his life to gain what he cannot keep. A man is no fool to give away his life to gain what he cannot keep. And when Jesus calls you to mission... Whatever that is, listen, you know what? You will be better off to obey Him. It's what you were designed to do. When you obey Jesus, you will thrive, not just survive. You'll thrive because you're doing what you're designed to do. Now, Jesus calls us to mission, mission, or as I like to call it, missional living. You know, it's not just when you go on a mission trip. It's everyday living. You can be missional in everyday living, and Jesus talks about that and in, 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 in really focuses on it in two passages, and they're both in Matthew. It, it's what we call the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. The Great Commandment is in Matthew chapter 22. The Great Commission is in Matthew 28. It's what we base our mission statement here at Enon on. Love God, love people, share Jesus, make disciples. And you see the love God and love people is in the Great Commandment. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 35, it says that, uh, that a lawyer came to Jesus, asked him a question, and he was testing him. He was trying to trip him up. How many of you know that there's no future in, in testing Jesus? Amen. Uh, he, you, you don't need to be testing him. You need to be worried about him testing you. But this lawyer hadn't learned that yet, and so he's trying to test Jesus, and he asked him this question. Verse 36, Teacher, what is the great commandment, greatest command, what is the great commandment in the law? Now let me tell you what this is the equivalent of. You ever seen a cartoon or a, a, a you know, little, little, usually it's a cartoon where, where somebody climbs up a mountain and there's a guy sitting up on the top of the mountain, you know, kind of meditating and everything. You climb up the mountain and you ask the guy on top of the mountain, the guru, what is the meaning of life? What is the purpose of life? Well, that's, that's what this question is. For this Jewish lawyer to ask Jesus, which is the greatest commandment, what he's basically saying is, what is life really all about? What is the most important thing in life? And notice what Jesus says. He answers him, and he said to him in verse 37, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. This is the great and foremost. Now, this was not controversial. What Jesus is doing here is he is quoting the Shema. He's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6. And the Shema was the, what, what they, uh, the rabbis called Israel to worship. Anytime Israel got together in a group, the first thing they did is a rabbi would get up and say, Shema, listen, O Israel, Shema, listen, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. And you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And everybody would agree with Jesus on this. This is a great commandment. This is not controversial. And uh, he says, it's the great and foremost commandment. So, love God. And then notice what he says in verse 39. The second is like it. And here he quotes Leviticus. He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then notice what this, this, this astounding last thing he says. He says, on these two, now watch this. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. In other words, what Jesus is saying is if you want to sum up if you want to know what the bottom line of the whole Old Testament is trying to teach, all of what Moses said, you ever read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, all, all of what Isaiah, Jeremiah, the Ezekiel, all the prophets said, you want to sum all that up, all it really comes down to is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And he puts those together. Now here's the thing. If you go and you study your Bible, what you'll find out is that loving God and loving people go together everywhere they are. You can't love God without loving people. And so he puts those things together. And then he gives his disciples the Great Commission. 
Matthew chapter 28, 19 and 20. Now, check out the scene. This is after Jesus died. He's risen from the dead. He spent some time with His disciples. He's about to ascend into heaven. He's about to leave them. This is His last words to the disciples. These are the marching orders. This is the call to the church. This is the call on what we ought to be about if we name the name of Jesus. And notice what He says, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples... Of all the nations. Now notice what the two components of, 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 of making disciples. First, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. they got to be saved, right? How many of you know you need to, you got to share Jesus with people in order for them to want to be baptized? So that's where we get share Jesus. And then notice the other part, make disciples, is teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So here's what we believe. We base our church mission statement on the great commandment and the great commission. Love God, love people, share Jesus, make disciples. What I want to encourage you about today is, is if your life is on mission, if you want to thrive, you will make this mission statement, not just the mission statement for our church, but it would be the mission statement for your life. This should be the mission statement. Love God, love people, share Jesus, make disciples, should be the mission statement for every Christian, every day, everywhere. It's not just for those involved in missions over there. It's involved for us here in Morris, Alabama, Kimberly, Alabama, here in us for every day that we live. Love God, love people, share Jesus. Now let's, let's break these down and apply it to individuals' lives. If you want to be on mission, here's how loving God works. The heart of your mission is loving God. If you want to be on mission, the heart of your mission is loving God. God, the heart of your mission is loving God. Notice what Jesus said in Matthew 22. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. I believe that this reflects the reality that we're created for mission. God, Jesus is telling us that we need to love God because you know what? You're created to be in a relationship with God. Your heart needs to be right with God. And the heart of, loving, of, of your mission is loving Him. You're created for more than just living. You know, there's a famous theologian named Augustine, St. Augustine. He lived back in the 4th century A.D. And uh, he uh, uh, wrote a lot of great books, probably the most influential theologian on the early church. And one of the things he's most famous for saying is, is that our hearts, he says this in his, in his book, The Confessions, one of the first autobiographies of the, of the, in, in the Western world, he says, our hearts, he's praying to God, he says, God, our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. That's the famous Augustine quote. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. In other words, a lot of people have taken that and said, said that we've got a God-shaped vacuum in our heart. Our hearts won't be satisfied by things in this world. They won't be satisfied by family, by job, by even the good things of life unless we have rest in our, and we have a right heart with God. Now, another great theologian, much later, named Mick Jagger. What? <laughs> Y'all know Mick Jagger, lead singer of the Rolling Stones? He said it like this. Y'all know what he said? I can't get no satisfaction, right? Look, that's just the other side of the coin. Augustine is talking about life from the side of somebody that knows God and knows what our heart's like. Mick Jagger's just out here. Now look, Mick Jagger had everything. He was on the top of the game. He was the most famous singer in the world. I mean, they were packing out every, everywhere. He was rich. He had more money he knew what to do with. He had all the, all the, all the pleasures of, of sin at his disposal. I mean, he could do anything he wanted to do, anytime he wanted to do it. And with all that money, all that success, all that pleasure, what does Mick Jagger say about his life? He says, I can't get no satisfaction. A little bit later, another great theologian, Bono, said it like this, I still haven't found what I'm looking for, right? Well, look, here's the thing. You need to know that your heart, if your heart is not right with God, you will never have satisfaction. Everybody knows that. There's a guy way before all of them, Augustine, Mick Jagger, Bono, any of them, his name was Solomon. He said it like this in the book of Ecclesiastes. He said, I, I, I set out to look at all of life. And Solomon was a king. He had, he had wealth. He had money. He had time. He could do anything he wanted to do. And he said he dedicated himself to finding meaning in life. 
And he looked at pleasure and he looked at learning and he looked at work and he, and he did all these different things trying to make his life make sense and to satisfy his heart. And you know what he came up and said? He said, everything is meaningless. All is vanity, says the preacher. It's all meaningless unless you have a right relationship with God. He says it like this in Ecclesiastes 3.11. He, God has made everything appropriate in its time and He's also set eternity in our hearts. And so your life, listen, will never have meaning until your heart is right with God. When your heart is not right with God, you can have the most amazing life experiences. You can be a King Solomon or you can be a Mick Jagger. But listen, you will not satisfy your longings for meaning and your longings for purpose. You're made to have more than that, more than this world can offer. When your heart is right with God, though, any of life's experience, all of life's experiences, the good, the bad, and the ugly, can be infused with satisfying meaning. You know, the Christian uh, gospel... The gospel of Jesus Christ, absolutely, historically. You might, you might argue about whether or not Jesus rose from the dead. You can argue about that from a, from, a, from a philosophical, historical standpoint. But you know one thing that nobody can deny? The belief that Jesus rose from the dead changed the world. It changed the world. And the gospel of Jesus Christ turned the Roman world upside down. You know how it did it? It didn't start with Caesar. It didn't start at the top and work its way down through a lot of laws and legislations. No, the gospel started at the bottom and worked its way up. The gospel spread throughout the Roman world first through slaves and the poorest of people. You know why? Because the gospel was the best news to a slave. The gospel was, a best, was the best news to somebody whose life did not make any sense whatsoever to them. Can you imagine what it might have been like to have been born into slavery? To have been born and not have any control over your life. Your life does not belong to you. You do what you're told or you don't have anything. And so all these slaves, their lives didn't have any meaning. And Jesus came along and you know what the Bible says Jesus did? He became a slave, right? He said the greatest among you will be your servant. And all the followers of Jesus said that to be a servant meant that you were going to be be honored in the kingdom of God. And it turned the world upside down. Paul, who loved to call himself a slave of Jesus, that's his favorite title for himself. He always said, I'm, I'm Paulus doulos to Christu. Paul, Paul, a servant. Paul, a slave of Jesus. That was his favorite title for himself. Paul, a slave of Christ. And listen to what Paul told slaves about how Jesus could change even their terrible circumstances. He says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 22, he gives instructions to slaves. And you've got to understand now, these passages have been misused and, and used to proof text and be held against, uh, used against people for racism purposes and stuff like that. But you need to understand, in their original context, this is good news to slaves that heard this. This is not justifying slavery. This is setting slavery, slaves free in their hearts and in their spirits. And notice what Paul says to him. He says, Slaves, in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but watch this, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily with your whole heart. As for the Lord, rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Here's my question to you this morning. Whatever your job is, you might be a student, you might be a teacher, you might be a, a law enforcement uh, an officer, you might be a firefighter, you might be a bricklayer, you might be a farmer, you might be whatever you are, a doctor, a lawyer. Are you doing what you do for Jesus? If you do what you do because you love Jesus, you know what? You can be on mission doing any job in the world. You can even be on mission being a slave and doing what somebody else, a master, tells you to do every day of the week. You can be on mission in any job when your heart is right. The heart uh, of your mission is loving God. Now, watch this. The measure of your mission is loving people. The measure of your mission is loving people. You get your heart right. You want to serve God. Now how do you know that you're serving God? Well the measure of your mission is loving 
people. Notice that Jesus put loving God and loving people together. It cannot be taken apart. He says in Matthew 22, verse 39, the second commandment is like the first. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You know, loving God and loving people go together all throughout the Bible. Did you realize that the Ten Commandments that Moses gave us, all the shall nots, did you realize that the first four of the Ten Commandments have to do with loving God and the last six have to do with our relationships with people? Love God and people. It's how it's put together. The Ten Commandments put them together. The prophets always put them together. But probably one of the clearest passages is, is the Apostle John, 1 John 4, verse 20. Listen to what he says about loving God and loving people. He says, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. You see, it's impossible to love God without loving people. You, if, if you love God, you're going to love people. That's the measure of it. So if you say, well, I'm doing everything I do from, for God, but you're not helping people in what you do, listen, you're deceived. You're not, really measure, you're not really on mission. The measure of our mission is whether or not we're loving people. Loving people is the measure of all we do. You know, even secular business people understand that. They, everybody knows if you go out and you take seminars about how to build a business, whether you're a banker, you know, whether you're a restaurant owner, whether you're a, a, a law enforcement officer, a teacher, whatever, how many of you know that your job is not just your job? Your job is the people you're serving with your job. The best teachers understand that their job is not, that their, their boss at the end of the day is not just a school district, it's all the students, right? The best pastors understand that their ministry is not just about their ministry. Their ministry is about the people that they're serving. The best public servants are those that understand that they're not working for the government. What, who are they working for? They're working for the people. Law, law enforcement officials, policemen, they're not just working for the law. They're serving people. Firefighters serving people. Everybody, any job you're doing, listen, you're going to be better at that job when you realize your job is not just your job. People are your job. And you are created. Here's the thing. You are created just like you're created to be have a right heart with God. You are created to be making a difference in people's lives. God designed you that way. And that's why Jesus is calling you out and saying, look, these are the greatest commandments. This is who you're supposed to be. Loving God and loving people. So look, we need to get involved. You need to get involved. You serve in at a church. Serve out in our community, our country. The world, we live in an isolated time. We live in a time where, you know, you can go your whole week and do everything you need to do online. I mean, you can order groceries. You can do all your banking. You don't have to talk to one person if you don't want to these days. But listen to me. You don't need to go hide away and be all by yourself. You need to get involved with people. It's for, better for your mental health. You know, psychiatrists have, uh, uh, will tell you that any psychological disorder, whether you're talking about anxiety disorder or, or depression or, or, or some kind of addiction or any kind of thing like that you're struggling with when it comes to a psychological disorder, they're all just variants of, of focusing on ourselves in unhealthy ways. And the key to getting over everything just about is learning to focus on other people in healthy ways. We need to be plugged into other people. You need to be involved in other people's lives, in healthy relationships. You grow all of this. Listen, it's investing in people. Next week we're going to talk about focusing on investing, focusing on giving. And all the giving is really about, you know, investing in people. That's what you're doing. And, and if you want to know God, God's a giver. He's going to raise you up to be a giver and to be somebody who's thinking about other people. Because God's that way. That's what it means to be like Him. And so we are always honoring God, listen, when we're helping people. That's the biblical truth. Now, are you helping people? That's my question to you this morning. The measure of your mission. If you're not on mission, you know what? You're just living your life. You're just worried about your paycheck. That's really what you're working for. And you're barely surviving. And you're kind of grumpy most of the time. <laughs> Aren't you? But you know what? If you are on mission, listen. You're loving people. You're investing in people. And you care about what you do and how it affects people around you. So the heart of our mission is uh, loving God. The measure of your mission is loving people. But now listen, this is, this is, I'm going to explain a little bit to you. The joy of your mission. The joy of your mission is sharing Jesus. 
The joy of your mission is sharing Jesus. Now, I believe the great commandment reflects who we're created to be. The great commandment's all about who we are as people. The great commission's about what we do. The great commandment shows us how we're, what we're created to be, but the great commission is Jesus calling us to do something, to make disciples, to share Jesus. And, you know, here's what I want you to, to know about sharing Jesus. You know, joy is a key to the Christian life. How many of you know that Nehemiah 8 verse 10 says that the joy of the Lord is your strength? You're strong as a Christian when you have joy. You need joy. God designed you to be joyful. He, God's a joyful God. Did you know God's joyful? He's happy. God's not depressed. God's not down. God, our God is in heaven, the Bible says. He does whatever He pleases. <laughs> He's happy. He's joyful. And He created us to have joy. And the joy of the Lord is your strength, Nehemiah 8 says. Paul says in several of his letters, particularly Philippians, 1 Thessalonians, he just says this, rejoice always. Now how many of you do that successfully? How many of you can say, I rejoice always? And we, we all struggle, don't we, with joy. I mean, all of us, sometimes we're happy, sometimes we're down, and you know, but we all struggle with it. But the normal Christian life should be a life that's characterized by joy. Now, where does sharing Jesus come to this? Well, let me show you what 1 John says. 1 John 1, what the Apostle John says about sharing Jesus and joy. Look at this, 1 John 1, 1. He says, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Now, here's what he's saying. He's saying, we met Jesus and He saved us. That's all John's saying, right? We saw Him, we talked to Him, we heard Him, and He gave us eternal life. We have met Jesus and we're saved. But now, notice this. Real joy doesn't just come from being saved and knowing Jesus. You have a joy of salvation. But all your joy doesn't just come from knowing Jesus. Listen, your joy also comes from sharing Jesus. Look at what he says in verse 3. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also. We're sharing this with you. We proclaim this to you also so that you may have fellowship with us. We want you to be in on this. We want to invite you to be a part of this. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. You know what salvation is? It's becoming part of the only healthy family in the universe. The only truly healthy, joyful family out there is, 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 is God. It's the Father and the Son. And He invites us to be a part of that relationship. And we should invite other people to be a part of that family. But then notice what He says in verse 4. This is what I want you to, to focus in on. These things we write. Why do we share Jesus? Look at this. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. So that our joy may be made complete. We are sharing Jesus with you so that our joy will be made complete, the Apostle John says. Now here's what I want you to, to, to see this morning. Most Christians, I believe, are living with incomplete joy because they're not investing in people with the real desire to see them to come to Christ. That's why we don't walk in the joy that God wants us to walk in. We are not giving ourselves to sharing Jesus. A lot of times there's two, there's, two, there's two things, I believe, that keeps us from sharing Jesus with people. One of them is inadequacy. We don't feel like we're worthy to do it. And the other is fear. Now, I'm going to address inadequacy first. I'm going to talk about fear at the end, all right? If you, if you say, Brother Russ, in my heart, I know God wants me to share Jesus with people. I've always wanted to. But I just never do feel like I'm adequate enough to do it. I don't know enough. What if they ask me a question I can't answer? What if they ask me something and I don't know? What if, what, what if, what if I not? Let me just encourage you on this. Listen, you do not have to be a Bible expert to share Jesus. Can I just let you off the hook? <laughs> you don't have to be a Bible expert to share Jesus. Now listen, I have st studied the Bible in an academic setting most of my adult life. I've got a BS, <laughs> Bachelor of Science in a Bachelor of Science in Religion and Greek. I've got a Master of Divinity in Religion. I've got a Ph.D. in New Testament. I've, I know a little bit about the Bible. But I can just tell you, look, I don't know everything. I, there, you can ask me questions I don't know. I don't know everything. 
You know what? Here's the thing. You don't have to know everything to share Jesus with somebody. You don't have to be an expert in the Bible. You don't have to be an expert in everything God has done. Listen, let me tell you what you are an expert in. You are the world's expert. You have a Ph.D. Every person in this room is the world's expert in what Jesus has done for you. Now, you know more about that than I know about it. You're smarter in what Jesus has done for you than I am in what Jesus has done for you. You know what Jesus... Listen, that's all you have to be willing to share. Now, you need to study. We're going to talk about learning in a minute. You ought to study. You know, you can study more about creation and evolution. You can study more about the reliability of the Bible and all these things. But let me just tell you something. Those are not the questions that change people's lives. What changes people's lives is the story of what Jesus has done in your life. And that's what you need to be willing to share. You're an expert in that. You are adequate in that. You don't have to be a mature Christian. You don't have to take any classes. You're just like the woman at the well. You remember the Samaritan woman at the well? Listen, she wasn't an expert in anything. She was a portless. She was the on the outcast of society. She was a, Her life was a mess. It had fallen apart. She had lived with four or five men and been in failed marriages. She was living with a man that wasn't her husband then. And she was she was not she was so out there that the ladies that, that lived with her, all the ladies in the village made her, they'd make fun of her when they went to get water. So she was tired of putting up with that. And she was getting water at the hottest part of the day just so she could be by herself because nobody had anything to do with her. She was on the bottom of society. The least qualified person in all of Israel. Jesus goes up to her, you know what he does? He says, Listen, I can give you living water. And when she talks about water and all that, he makes, her, he, he makes her understand that he's talking about satisfying her soul. And Jesus tells her about her husbands. He knows all about her sin. He's Jesus, right? How many of you know Jesus knows all about your sin? He knows all about her. And he describes her to her. And then he still says, I can give you living water. You know what? She goes back. You know what she does when she realizes who Jesus is? She doesn't go off on a retreat and meditate on it for days. She goes right back to the village and immediately starts talking to people who know more about the Bible than she does, I guarantee it. Who know more than she does. She goes back to that village and tells them about Jesus. And notice what she tells them about. Look at this. This is beautiful. John chapter 4, verses 28 and 29. So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all the things I have done. And she's not even 100% sure yet, but she says, this is not the Christ, is it? And you know what those people do? They come out, they meet Jesus, and they all get saved too. But it's based on a woman, listen, who was not qualified. She was not adequate, but she was willing to tell people what Jesus had done for her. And you know what he did for her? He told her how bad a person he was, but that he still loved her. (laughs) How many of you know that everybody in this room needs to know somebody who knows everything about you but still loves you? How many of you know that every day you go to work, every day you go to a restaurant, every day you go about your business, there are people in your work, there are people in your home, there are people in your neighborhood who need to know that somebody knows everything about them and still loves them. That's the good news of the gospel. That is good news, and when you can help somebody understand it, let me tell you something, that's the best thing you can be a part of. That's where joy comes from is sharing that good news with people. It's that simple. And you know what? Here's the, At the end of the day, we're just like that, that, that Samaritan woman. Every one of us, whether you got a Ph.D. or an MDiv, or you just, you know, you're, you're, you're just, you're, you're, you don't have any degrees whatsoever. My Meemaw, uh, you know, uh, didn't, uh, just went to one year of college. She read her, I put my Meemaw up against anybody in knowing the Bible. She just liked to read the Bible. That's all you really need to do to know, know the Lord is just like to read the Bible. And here's the thing, whatever degrees you've got, We're all just thirsty people telling thirsty people where the water is. And are you willing to do that? That's the joy of your mission, being sharing Jesus. And then the last thing is the impact. The impact of your mission is making disciples. Do you really want to leave a legacy? Do you want your life to make an impact? Well, here's here's what I want you to know. You need to share Jesus. That's the joy of it. But if you really want to make a difference in this world, you need to be about making disciples. Disciples. Now, Dr. Herschel Hobbs was a, a, a great uh, Southern Baptist preacher, pastor, theologian. 
Uh, and he said one time, he said, the work of evangelism is never complete until the one evangelized becomes an evangelizer. Now, I know that that's evangelism is a word we don't use a lot much these days. It just really means this. The work of sharing Jesus is never complete until the one who received Jesus is sharing Jesus. Here's your goal as a believer in Jesus. It's not just to see people saved. It's to see saved people sharing Jesus. Let me just tell you something. You can be a part of helping not just see people saved. You can be a part of making disciples. You can. Everybody in this room can. If you want to make, be a part of making disciples, what does Jesus say? Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, He says that, that it means to be teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. As you learn the ways of Jesus, you teach people the ways of Jesus. Everybody in this room can learn and everybody in this room can teach. Spiritual growth comes from learning. You need to learn, but it also comes from teaching. You say, well, how do I learn? Well, you can learn from a person. Maybe God will put somebody in your life from time to time that you're learning from and you're learning more about who Jesus is. You're learning more about how to live for Jesus in, 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 different, in different areas. You know, you might be, uh, might be uh, at your job and, and God might put an older Christian that does your job there. You ought to learn from that, from that older Christian. You ought to learn from somebody that's walking with the Lord and seek always to be learning from somebody that knows more than you. You can learn from books. There's lots of opportunities to learn and grow. We, we are committed to helping you learn here at Enon. You can connect. I hope, I hope that you're learning something from me when I preach. But you can also connect in life groups every Sunday morning, our Sunday school hour. You can be involved in equip groups where we uh, help you. you know, we have a men's Bible study that starts this Tuesday morning at 6 a.m. Wisdom for Every Man is a study of the book of Proverbs. You come and, and learn the ways of the Lord with us. You know, we, we had a ladies' Bible study starting up in Monday, February the 12th. We've got uh, How to Share Jesus in Everyday Conversations. It starts Tuesday, February the 6th at, at 6.30 over there, a, a four-week class on How to Share Jesus. We got Wednesday nights, February the 7th. We start up a whole lot of new classes. You can find out about all the details of that. There's an uh, insert we put in the bulletin last week that says equip on it. You can pick this up if you didn't get one last week. It's two sides of all the opportunities that we're offering this spring for you to be able to learn and grow in your faith with Jesus. And you can pick that up right out there in the, uh, in the foyer and, and see what the, which of those classes the Lord might lead you to. So we always need to be learning. But listen, you also need to teach. Everybody needs to be teaching somebody. You say, well, Brother Russ, I'm not a teacher. Well, you may not stand in front of a class. You may not stand in front of a group. But listen, you're, you're connected to somebody, your family. If you're a dad, listen, if you're a mom, if you're a parent, you're teaching your kids something. The question is, are you teaching them the good things or are you teaching them the wrong things, right? You're teaching them. You are a teacher. If you're, if you're involved in a neighborhood, you're teaching somebody something, whether you, whether you realize it or not. But listen, you can be intentional with your family, with your friends, your co-workers, your neighbors. When you are receiving, when you're growing in the Lord and you're helping other people grow, that's the key. Look, it's got to come in, and, but then it's got to go out. And the gospel is meant to flow. What did Jesus tell the woman at the well? It's living water. Living water moves. And so you're receiving, you're growing in the Lord, and you're helping other people grow. That's what it means to be dedicated to making disciples. And most of that happens, listen, the best of that happens one on one. You know, if you're just in, investing in one person, that is an awesome thing to do as a Christian. You're making disciples. That's what your mission is. And a lot of times, Jesus' plan, I believe, was more about the one-on-one -on -one than it was the big crowds. Now, I love big crowd stuff. We do events here, you know, and, uh, and I, I love sharing the gospel with, with a lot of people at once and seeing, you know, I'm all about Billy Graham crusades and all that kind of stuff. But listen, that's not Jesus' plans. It's not crusades. It's not a hero coming out and being the, the celebrity preacher. Jesus' plan is based on every Christian sharing with other people one-on-one -on -one, that's where the real action is you realize the power of one-on-one -on -one disciple making you know it's an interesting thing if you if you share Jesus if you just 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 would disciple one person if the Lord if you would ask the Lord Lord I want to be a disciple maker and I want to share Jesus I'm going to I'm the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to learn how to walk with you I want to be the kind of Christian who is sharing Jesus you find somebody you come talk to me, I'll help you, all right? And, and, and look, you, you, you get your life 
you, you become a disciple, and then you say, you know what, I'm going to start looking for other people I'm going to help to become the kind of Christian they need to be. I'm going to be the kind of Christian who helps other people get to the point to where they can share Jesus with people. Do you realize if you did that and you're one, you'd have two people, you and another person. But you know, if, you, if every year you'd find somebody to pour into, and that's what you were teaching other people, in year two, you'd have four people because you'd pick somebody and your new guy would pick somebody, right? Year three, you'd have eight people. Year four, you'd have 16. Year five, you'd have 32. Year 10, you'd have 1,024. Year 15, you'd have 32,768 people. By year 20, you'd have a million. That, that's the power of multiplication. By year 30, in 30 years, you could have over a billion people. Year 31, you'd have 2.5, billion people. That's almost the population, entire Christian population today. 33 years in the span of a life, you could have 8.6 billion disciples. The current population of the world is 7.3 billion. That's Jesus' plan. What did he start with? He didn't start with a big crowd. He started with 12 disciples, right? And he said, go and make disciples. That's the legacy. Do you want to leave a legacy? Are you, are you, leaving, are you making money or are you making disciples? Making disciples is without doubt the most impactful thing you can do. If you want to move from making a living to making a difference, if you want to move from surviving to thriving, dedicate yourself to learning. How can I be a disciple? How can I make a disciple? Now here's what I know. The biggest obstacle to, to all this whether it's sharing Jesus or making disciples, the minute I start talking about this, like I said, there's two problems. There's two, there's two problems. Inadequacy, we've talked about that. But then there's fear. Every Christian is fearful when it comes to sharing the gospel. You know, Paul said, pray for me that I'd have the courage to be able to share the gospel. Aren't you glad that Paul said he needed courage? You know why? Because he struggled with fear just like me and you. I'm a, I'm a highly trained professional. Right? But you know, every time... I'm about to share the gospel. You know what comes over me? Fear. I mean, I can be about to share the gospel with a, with a kid, 10-year-old kid, and something in me makes me afraid, you know? You know what it is? I, here's what I believe it is. It's the fear of rejection. Because here's what you, what, what's going to happen. You think about sharing the gospel with your friends. You think about sharing the gospel with your family. You think about sharing the gospel with somebody. And you know what, 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 what you're worried about? They might reject you. They probably will reject. You've seen them reject other people. They might make fun. They might think you're kind of weird, that kind of stuff. You know, they rejected Jesus. Jesus was rejected. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't give up, even though he was rejected? Now, here, let me tell you something about rejection. Let me tell you a story. Here's what I learned about rejection and sharing the gospel. When I was in college at Union University, I was over the outreach part of the student ministry my junior year. And one, one thing that I really loved doing and, and all that was to go to prison ministry. I did a lot of prison ministry as a college student and, and uh, a little bit later. And uh, one of the places I would go was Wilder Youth Defen D Detention Center, which is right outside of Memphis. And it was all some, a lot of the worst kids from the, from the region all around Memphis uh, in trouble with the law. They go there and they were in jail basically as, as teenagers and, and kids. And um, I had a couple of, uh, they were all lived in these pods. And I would go to a couple of the pods. I had one guy that was really trying to walk the Lord. He was a former gang member in Memphis. And God had got a hold of him and had a great time with him every time I went to visit with him. Had another guy that was kind of interested but wasn't all in yet. I'd go and encourage him and try to share with him some. But I, I, I went one time over to uh, the, 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 the pod that was dedicated uh, to the kids. It was kind of like their solitary confinement. They don't, they don't put kids in solitary confinement. But they separated the kids that could not handle themselves at all away from the general population and put them over here in this, in this special pod. And when I went over there uh, one time before, they wouldn't let me talk to the kid there. His name was Marcus uh, because Marcus, they said, was a crack baby. He was born... Uh, his mama was addicted to crack. She was high on crack the whole time he, she was pregnant with him. And he was born with her being high on crack. And he was severely, he couldn't hardly even carry on a conversation. Couldn't speak. Just really, just a, just a, a confused, messed up little 10-year-old boy. And so Marcus, they, just, they wouldn't let me talk to him. But one time I went over there, and uh, there was another kid in there who was about 14 years old. And I said, well, can I talk to, to him? And, and they said, well, you, if, if he wants to, you can talk to him. So I asked him, he said, yeah, I'd, li I'd like to talk. 
And so I went in and, I, and they left Marcus in the little room there where I was talking to this 14-year-old kid. So I'm sitting at the table across the, 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 the table from a 14-year-old juvenile delinquent sharing the gospel with him. Marcus is in the room. He goes over, and I don't know why the guard did this, but they left a, a broom out. And there was a broom over in the corner of the room. This, this, this Marcus goes over, picks up this broom, walks over to the table where I'm sharing with this kid, and starts swinging the broom at me. I guess he thought I had something on my face. I don't know. You know, Laura comes up and picks on me all the time. I thought something was there, but he was swinging that broom at me, barely missing me. I mean, it was coming, it was about that far from my head, every swing. Hard as he could, like that. Now, you know what the Lord did for me? Now, I don't always do this. I'm, if, if, if you came and start swinging a broom at me this afternoon, I might, you might scare me, all right? But God just gave me a piece. I don't know how to describe it other than that. And the Spirit of God just gave me a piece. You know what I did? I just, I just ignored Marcus. And I just, I just kept talking to this kid. I probably talked to him for about another 10 minutes. The whole time, Marcus is swinging that broom right at my head. Now, I get done talking to the kid. I get up. And I start to go to the door. You know what Marcus did? He put down the broom. And when I got to the door, he came up to me. And he gave me the biggest bear hug I've ever gotten. Hugged me tight. Didn't want to let me go. I had to, had to almost pry him off. I hugged him back. He was hugging on to me for dear life. Now, I didn't say anything. The kid was messed up. But, you know, he didn't say hardly anything just you know thank you for coming I think something like that but I mean he just was messed up little kid but he held on to me you know what I believe you know what the Lord showed me about that now listen there's a little bit of a Marcus in every one of us we all reject the Lord at some point and you know what when God says I love you when somebody claims to love you you know what you got to test it out and believe it and Marcus had never had anybody that loved him Everybody in Marcus's life were afraid. He was either a problem or they were afraid of him his whole life. And you know what he was coming over there? He was swinging that broom because I was coming in there. He listened to me for a few minutes. I was coming in there claiming to love them. I was coming in there claiming that Jesus can make a difference in their lives. And you know what Marcus was doing? He was testing that out. And I believe with all my heart that every time Marcus swung that broom, you know what I think he was saying in his heart? Please don't leave. Please don't be like the others. Please be able to handle me. Please be strong enough to, to stay here with me. Please don't leave. Please don't leave. You know what? Here's the thing. There are people out there who need to know Jesus. And they might reject you. They might make fun of you. But listen, you keep seeking them like Jesus sought you. Amen? And you love them anyway. And you stay in the game. Because every swing they take at you, they're really in their heart, I believe, saying, be real. Be real. Love God. Love people. Share Jesus. Make disciples. Are you on mission? Well, if you're here this morning and you're not on mission, you need to give your heart to Christ. You say, Brother Russ, I'm not on mission because I'm not saved. I need Jesus to come into my life. Well, we're going to stand in just a moment. I'm going to pray for us. We're going to sing. You come today. Give your heart to Christ. You may be here today. You say, Brother Russ, I am saved, but I'm, I've, I've veered. I'm not, I'm not walking with the Lord like I need to. I want to get on mission for the Lord. Well, listen, this, this altar is open. You seek the Lord where you are. You call out to Him, and you say, Lord, help me today to walk with you. Help me to follow you. Help me to love God, love people, share Jesus, make disciples. Help me to be all you've created me to be, all you are calling me to be. You may be here today and you say, Brother, I want to be a part of, of this church. I want to be a part of a church that's on mission. Well, we'd love to have you here at Enon Baptist Church. Whatever your decision is, let's all stand together. Let me pray for us. Brother Ken will come and lead us. Lord, we love you today. God, we thank you so much, Lord, that you're a great king. Lord, thank you that you call us to be on mission. Thank you that you've created us for mission. God, thank you today. That, Lord, we can love God. We can love people. We can share Jesus. We can make disciples. And our life can make a difference. Lord, I just pray in Jesus' name that you'd have your hand on this invitation time. Bless us now as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.